aren't the conservative free market ideas sometimes hard to sell? I think of the, uh, uh, the labor unions and liberals are now attacking Walmart mm -hmm. and saying Walmart pays its employees uh, too little. Uh, I mean, that's a nice thing to be for. You know, you want more money for people who work at Walmart. What's wrong with that? Hey, I want more money for myself. I, I, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that someone else has an obligation to pay it. Uh, if you're paying people for their work, uh, instead of just paying them for what they think they need, uh, then clearly these people wouldn't be working for Walmart if someone else thought their work was worth more than Walmart is paying. So uh, why, why do you think liberals have jumped on Walmart? Uh, because of its success? Because of its success. That's, that's a sufficient reason. Uh, they, they, they really are for helping, uh, they're for helping people who are disadvantaged, as they put it. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereas I think conserv conservatives want, want to stop people from being disadvantaged. You know, they, 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 the liberals want to help the poor while they're poor, but really the biggest benefit is to stop them from being poor. And th that they have very little interest in. What is the liberal premise? I guess uh, uh, the Rousseau notion, you know, that man is born free but is everywhere and changed, that the real problem of the world is that the institutions are wrong. If the institutions were right, then man, were, there, there was nothing in human nature that would cause us to be unhappy is the fact that we have the wrong institution. What is the conservative premise? That uh, man is flawed from, uh, from day one and that uh, you, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs and whatever you do to deal with one of man's flaws it creates another problem but that you try to get the best trade-off you can get and that's all you can hope for. Uh, I've often said uh, there, there are three questions that I think would destroy most of the arguments on the left and the first is uh, compared to what? The second is, at what cost? And the third is, what hard evidence do you have? Now, there are very few ideas on the left that can pass all three of those kinds of things. Can conservative ideas pass those? Yes, I think so, because they, they, they don't assume that there, that there is a solution out there. Uh, you know, Adam Smith didn't believe that, the, that, the, that the, the, either the government or the market could solve all problems, that you have to be able to simply tolerate certain things. Uh, and the idea to the left of tolerating any evil, you know, that they want to stamp out the last vestige of segregation. Really? At what price? The three questions Thomas Sowell asks, compared to what, at what cost, and what hard evidence do you have? These are relevant to both the right and the left. When the housing market collapsed in 2008 and resulted in a world financial crisis, it was so quick and easy to blame the Republican ideals, greedy bankers, and Wall Street. In his book, the housing boom and bust, Dr. Sowell lays out many factors that contributed to the housing issue. One of the overriding points is to note that the federal government's push for low-income housing over the previous decades put tremendous pressure on lenders to reduce their underwriting standards. Government-imposed quotas on low-income mortgage approvals meant more and more risk was being taken by financial institutions. This was done under the premise that home ownership was important. So important, in fact, that asking questions like, compare to what? at what cost and what hard evidence do you have that it's even necessary stopped being asked altogether. The Democrats love to point to the deregulation so often associated with the right and use this as an example of how the Republican policy and ideology failed during the years under George W. Bush leading up to the housing market crash. They claim to be free market advocates when it's really an anything goes mentality. No regulation, no supervision, no discipline. Now, I was never a fan of George W. Bush, but the fact is that the Republicans were pushing for greater regulatory controls of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac throughout George W. Bush's administration, and it was the Democrats who were against it. The Bush administration raised red flags starting in April 2001. The O2 budget request declares that the size of mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is, quote, a potential problem because financial trouble in either one of them could, quote, cause strong repercussions in financial markets. In 2003, the White House warning about Fannie and Freddie was upgraded to a systemic risk that could spread beyond just the housing sector. In fall of 03, the Bush administration was pushing Congress hard to create a new federal agency to regulate and supervise Fannie and Freddie, both government-sponsored enterprises, or GSEs. We need a strong, uh, world-class regulatory agency to oversee the prudential operations of the GSEs uh, and the safety 
and the soundness of their financial activities. But then Treasury Secretary Snow was getting a lot of pushback from then-ranking member, now chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Democratic Congressman Barney Frank. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not in a crisis. In fact, Frank said the federal government should be encouraging Fannie and Freddie to do more to get low-income families into homes. And he believed too many people had a sky-is-falling mentality. The more people in my judgment, exaggerate a threat of safety and soundness. The more people conjure up the possibility of serious financial losses to the Treasury, which I do not see, I think we see entities that are fundamentally sound financially and uh, withstand some of the disaster scenarios. And even if there were a problem, the federal government doesn't bail them out. But the more pressure there is there, then the less I think we see in terms of affordable housing. The legislation was blocked. In 2005, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan added his voice on Fannie and Freddie after Fannie leaders admitted major accounting screw-ups. Quote, enabling these institutions to increase in size, and they will once the crisis in their judgment passes, we are placing the total financial system of the future at a substantial risk. Adding later at another hearing on the topic, If we fail to strengthen GSE regulation, we increase the possibility of insolvency and crisis. But the two mortgage giants had staunch defenders. Democratic Senator Charles Schumer said, quote, I think Fannie and Freddie over the years have done an incredibly good job and are an intrinsic part of making America the best housed people in the world. If you look over the last 20 or whatever years, they've done a very, very good job. I've Senator John McCain co-sponsored legislation pushing for regulation, delivering a speech on the Senate floor in 2006. Quote, for years I have been concerned about the regulatory structure that governs Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And the sheer magnitude of these companies and the role they play in the housing market, the GSEs need to be reformed without delay. That bill made it out of the Senate Banking Committee with a party-line vote. All of the Democrats voted against it, but fearing that they didn't have the votes to pass it, Republicans didn't even bring it up on the Senate floor. Senator Obama did not weigh in on that bill. Now, this is not a right versus left issue alone. Under Bill Clinton, the securitization of low-income mortgages became mandated with 30% as the initial target. Under his administration, this was raised to 50%. Under George W. Bush, it was raised still higher to 55%. Even though the Bush administration pushed for greater regulation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, pushing for Wall Street and private banking reform in any meaningful way was lacking. There are arguments as to what caused the housing bubble, including what caused it to burst. The economic issues are complicated and include the Federal Reserve, home buyers themselves, many of whom bought property only as an investment while being too eager to take the risks they knew they couldn't afford, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. Wall Street firms who bought the risky loans converted them into bonds which were rubber stamped with AAA ratings, then passed them on to unsuspecting investors played a huge role. Bill Clinton repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, allowing commercial banks to merge with investment firms, but didn't place any regulatory agencies to oversee them. This allowed banks to become bigger and take greater risks. The government, however, both Republicans and Democrats, placed the ideal of home ownership at the top of their list of priorities. By placing the focus on the social goal of home ownership and putting artificial pressure on a free market system, the checks and balances failed and profiteers were left to run wild. When it comes to the radical left today, pushing for social agendas without asking those three important questions is just as dangerous as ever. Stopping dialogue and using violence on both sides means that we will lose sight of the premise of the original arguments. Whether it's calls for diversity that conflict with their collective goals, calls for equality of outcome without looking at all factors involved, or denying biological differences in the sexes to demand the acceptance of a social agenda, we all have to look at the solutions that are being proposed and ask those three questions. The same radical left that stifles and discourages discussion rarely, if ever, provides details on their own position that provide answers. I'm going to close with a few clips of Barney Frank. The first is from June of 2005, where he was making a speech on the House floor. This is followed by a clip of him speaking at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. on December 11th, 2006. This is a very important resolution, particularly at this time, because we have, I think, an excessive degree of concern right now about home ownership and its role in the economy. 
obviously speculation is never a good thing. But those who argue that housing prices are now at the point of a bubble seem to me to be missing a very important point. Unlike previous examples we have had where substantial excessive inflation of prices later caused some problems, we are talking here about an entity, home ownership, homes, where there is not the degree of leverage that we have seen elsewhere. This is not the dot-com situation. We have problems with people having invested in business plans for which there was no reality, the people building fiber optic cable for which there was no need. Homes that are occupied may see an ebb and flow in the price at a certain percentage level, but you're not going to see the collapse that you see when people talk about a bubble. And so those of us on our committee in particular will continue to push for home ownership. We have more to do yet in the deregulation. I'm just saying it. One of the things we did was to try and reduce the reporting requirement from the banks to the uh, uh, financial detectives. Uh, and far too much has to be reported now, in my judgment. We weren't doing anything for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, at least most of us. For me, the motivation was housing. We were doing something for housing. And I agreed with those who argued that because of the market's perceptions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got this great benefit in being able to borrow money cheaply, but that the benefit was not being adequately returned to the public. Now, there were two things you could have done about that. You could have reduced the benefit. You could have cut back on their ability, in effect, to borrow as cheaply. Or you could leave that benefit in place and distribute it more fairly. That's what we chose to do with the Affordable Housing Fund. In 2007, Barney Frank was the original co-sponsor of the Expanding American Home Ownership Act. This act made further changes to the National Housing Act that lowered standards for home ownership and encouraged people to put themselves in greater and greater risk of default. It extended term mortgages from 35 to 40 years and officially allowed for the borrowing of 100% of the appraised value of the property plus costs with zero down. Links to the full text and summary are in the description. It's important to recognize that housing prices have been dropping for many, many months when this was passed. In 2009, after the crash, Barney Frank is interviewed by Tavis Smiley and says that pretending people can do something they can't is no favor for them. And he states that conservatives wrongfully pushed home ownership on people. You know, people haven't fully understood. One of the causes of the terrible crisis we had uh, over the last few years, which has given us today's problem, um, it came from people being pushed into buying houses, taking out loans that they couldn't afford. Part of that was a conservative view that rental housing was a bad thing. I had been trying with a lot of others to try and continue programs to build decent rental housing for people. What we had were people in power who didn't, didn't like that, and they said, no, no, we'll help them become homeowners. Well, people were pushed into home ownership who shouldn't have been there. So what I did today, because we have now in, in Barack Obama, a president who understands this, that if you are low income in America, if you're poor, you probably are not going to be able to afford a home. You know, people have said to me, well, wouldn't you want to own a home? Sure, I'd like to eat more and not gain weight. Uh, but you can't be unrealistic about what, what's going to happen. And so I met with a group of people today who are very responsible advocates for building decent, affordable rental housing. But how does that, I, I hear the point, and I'm glad you're on the case there, Congressman, but how does that ultimately lead to home ownership? Because you, you can't tell me you want to sell these folks short on the American dream. Well, it may not be to home ownership. Yes, I, I don't want to sell them short. I want to recognize, though, times that they may come up short. Pretending people can do something they can't do is no favor for them. I wish we could do something about income inequality in America, and I'm for that. I would like to get better education uh, all up and down the social sphere so people can earn more money. I'd like to bring down the cost of housing. But at the point when people are making, frankly, thirty or $40,000 a year in much of this country, they're not going to be able to afford a home. And if you pretend that they can, you get them into trouble. Finally, in 2010, Mr. Frank states that his view has always been that it's a mistake for government to heavily subsidize home ownership. My own view has always been that it's a mistake for the government heavily to subsidize home ownership and that we are much better off trying to subsidize rental housing because when you put people in a decent rental housing, you do not confront the problems that we have seen from putting people inappropriately into uh, home ownership.
I guess that's one way to avoid having to answer any of the three questions posed by Dr. Soul. You can always lie and simply state that you never held that idea and never pushed an altruistic goal without regard for any costs. Remember, like and subscribe, but most importantly, leave comments and engage with others. Open discussion is always needed. If you have nothing valid to say, Zero Fox Given.